Welcome to Immigration Uncovered, the DocketWise video podcast where we dive deep into the world of immigration law with the latest developments, practice management strategies, and the transformative impact of legal technology. I'm James Pittman. This is episode 28, and I have uh, with me today Justin Estep, who is the Senior Director of Immigration and Refugee Services for Catholic Charities of Central Texas. We're going to be discussing the Texas law SB4. Justin, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. So, Justin, let's, I mean, this is such an evolving situation. Can you um, tell us, first of all, let's, for those who haven't been following it closely, can you provide an overview of uh, Texas Law SB4 and what it is about it? What are its key provisions? Sure. So, the Texas Law SB4 uh, came about last legislative session uh, in the Texas legislature 2023. Um, the idea behind it was that. Uh, the Texas legislature as a whole uh, felt that the federal government wasn't doing their job as far as uh, managing the border. So uh, in lieu of the federal government in their eyes stepping in uh, or lack thereof stepping in and uh, enforcing immigration laws, they felt that it was necessary for the state to enact uh, some new regulations. And so over the course of both the regular legislative session and then up to the fourth special session, which uh, we had multiple of them after the normal session, they passed eventually basically two parts of the same bill of SB4. The first part that went into effect uh, back in February was an enhancement for laws already on the books. So human smuggling, pretty much illegal everywhere, federal and state level. But what they did to the human smuggling laws in Texas is enhance the mandatory minimum punishments. Up to this point, it had really reflected the federal uh, mandatory minimums, but enhanced those from two years up to 10 years uh, for a standard situation, as well as uh, for those operating stash houses and things of that nature. So all of that has already gone into effect, and that was passed in the third special session. But in the fourth special session, the final part of SB4 was passed, which did create two new laws. Uh, both of these laws had to do with the idea of creating an illegal entry into Texas uh, from a foreign nation. So if someone comes into the state of Texas from a foreign country around a point of entry, then they can fall under the uh, enforcement and prosecution of this law. Uh, the first offense, uh, just illegal entry into the state of Texas from a foreign nation, uh, would essentially come about where a person who is arrested due to the fact that either an officer sees them crossing the river into the state of Texas or somehow can get probable cause that they have entered the state somewhat recently. Um, they are arrested for illegal entry. They go in front of a judge uh, or a magistrate. And then once that occurs, two things can happen. Either they can go forward with the uh, legal proceedings as any normal criminal case, or the judge or magistrate, if they meet certain qualifications, can offer them uh, to not move forward with the legal proceedings, but that the law enforcement officer, at least this is our assumption, because uh, the law isn't really clear on a lot of its parts, uh, would then take that individual to the uh, border with Mexico and order them to to cross. Now, the second part of the law that passes part of part of illegal entry was illegal reentry. So illegal reentry essentially says, a, if you go to the border under illegal entry and you're ordered to leave and you do not, then you can be arrested for illegal reentry, which now, instead of a misdemeanor, is a felony with a uh, sentence up to 20 years. And then illegal reentry also is classified as someone who has been previously ordered moved from the country, deported, whatever the case may be, and then reenters the country uh, again around a point of entry. Uh, they can be prosecuted under the illegal reentry law, even if they weren't originally arrested uh, and prosecuted by state law enforcement. So that's SB4 in a nutshell, essentially. And while, like I said, the enhancements to the smuggling portions of the law have gone through and aren't being challenged in court, the uh, two new laws that are, have been created uh, have been challenged and are currently on hold. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, and this has such enormous consequences. I mean, it's been in the news continuously, and because, uh, you know, you have a the immigration statute, the federal immigration statute. I mean, arguably, is a situation of field preemption, where, you know, you can argue that Congress has really intended to legislate across the board and 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 have the entire, uh, you know, sort of 
immigration law across the country uniform. And that obviously will conflict if states start additionally making their own laws with regard to entry into the United States. Before we go deeper, are you aware of any other situation where a border state has um, specifically enumerated a state crime for entering from a foreign country? Yeah, the last time this was attempted was uh, in Arizona a little over a decade ago, where they essentially tried to pass the same law and enforce the same law, except it went a little bit farther in that particular situation and was eventually declared unconstitutional. In that, in that law, and this is whenever myself and several other folks were testifying against the law last year, pointed out is the law, you know, was declared unconstitutional due to the supremacy clause and things that you've mentioned. And the Texas legislature is arguing that, well, what's different is the Arizona law specifically said they would deport, like somehow transport individuals, either pay for plane tickets or drive them in a bus across the border. And that in and of itself was reason enough to declare the law unconstitutional and that particular element was kind of what the court hung its hat on so what texas has done is essentially said no we're not deporting anyone um we are just asking them to go to the border and if they don't you know cross once we've asked them to under the conditions i already enumerated then we can rearrest them and then prosecute them with a felony but since we're technically not transporting them over the border that's what's difference between our law and the Arizona law uh, from, I believe, 2011. So it has been attempted before and failed, but Texas is trying to get around the, uh, like I said, the element that, kind of, that the Supreme Court hung its hat on previously to justify this particular law. Uh, understood. But is that a distinction without a difference? Correct. Is it, <laughs> well, I mean, how does this work? And let's just understand what they, what they envision here, and then we'll get to the, the legal posture. In the case. Sure. I mean, you, so we're going to have, you know, sort of the Brownsville, you know, police department or the Texas state troopers kind of put someone in a car and nicely drive them to the border checkpoint in a friendly way and in a friendly way say, you know, would you please leave now? Is that I mean, is that really where and then so they, they, they do envision the law enforcement taking the person to the U.S. side of the border and then sort of letting them out and saying, you're supposed to leave now. And that if they don't, they're supposed to be charged with a crime on the spot or if they hang around or, or do they even know what they expect? No, they don't. Um, that actually came up in the, uh, uh, in the court cases here in the last few days. Uh, I, I believe it was uh, at the Fifth Circuit, but it might have been the Supreme Court. But essentially, a Texas solicitor was asked, uh, solicitor general was asked, how is this exactly going to play out? And that was questions that we had as attorneys and immigrant advocates at the legislative level of like, well, how is this actually going to work? And they really can't articulate exactly how it works. But this is essentially what we've been told is that, yes, they would essentially drive them to the border. If they were originally arrested for for illegal entry, they would ask them to go across. And at that point, if they didn't go across, they would rearrest them under the probable cause for, well, now that's illegal reentry because they're refusing an order. To, to leave, and then they would go and be prosecuted uh, for the felony. But that it brings up several issues. A, this is not for folks from Mexico. This is could be anyone. It could be from Guatemala or Brazil or Cameroon. And they're going to tell you to go back to Mexico. And Mexico has very specifically said that we will not accept these folks if you try to do that. So that's the first issue. And then secondly, if I was this particular immigrant, then I, the first thing I would do would be walk straight up to a CEP officer and ask for asylum. And then at what point, you know, then again, we get this conflict of federal and state law. So in practicality, it seems hard to see how it'll play out. And the law is very much leaving that up to the interpretation of the law enforcement officers themselves and the judges and magistrates, which is, again, another concern. This sounds like a dumpster fire. I mean, I mean yeah. let, let's hear me out here. All the things that can go wrong. And all of the glaring, gaping chasms in how the, the law is actually supposed to treat people that this introduces. First of all, how are local law enforcement or state troopers supposed to find, ascertain whether someone is in the country illegally or not? I mean, does it? do they have to see the person having crossed or do they assume that? Can they ask for papers? Secondly, if they're asking for papers or proof that the person's in the U.S. legally, whether it's a visa, it's a 94 record or, or what have you, or a green card, 
for, for are they trained? Is their training being implemented so that they understand and know what they're looking at? Since local law enforcement is not trained for immigration law, it's hard enough to get immigration agents to apply the law in the correct manner, let alone tasking personnel for whom there is no training to try to do it on the fly. So that's that's the next question. Thirdly, as you said, you could be apprehending or stopping people from other countries and then in, enticing them to go to Mexico. And what provisions on the Mexican side are there for conducting normal border control and passport control uh, on the Mexican side? I mean, if it's if they are their nationals, ass assume that they would take their own nationals back. I mean, but uh, people from third countries who just happen to be found in Texas and then enticed to go without authorization to Mexico introduces problems in a practical level. It introduces probably, you know, problems of a diplomatic nature between the U.S. Absolutely. and Mexico, which we can speculate on how on how that might play out. And then, as you mentioned, it introduces the the problem that there are people who uh, let's I mean, let's we're going to get into this talk about people who have potential legitimate claims for Absolutely. asylum withholding of removal, what have you, uh, who could potentially be denied if you're having uh, them uh, transported to Mexico without the chance to. I mean, the local law enforcement are not able uh, to conduct credible fear interviews. They're not authorized to, you know, keep people in detention pending an asylum hearing or anything like that. Where are those rights going to go? I mean, are those rights going to be just sort of ignored by the implementation of the state law. So there's many, many problems here that will arise. Um, and I don't think, and this has been done really without having thought thought this through. So let's let's first, before we get to all of those issues, what's the status right now of the legal challenge? A couple of days ago, we saw the Supreme Court had a, said that they were going to allow it to go into effect. And now we're back in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and at latest news, there has been a stay granted by the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. So wh where else are we procedurally? So yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, it was, um, to quote uh, Professor Stephen Vladek, who was interviewed on the on the situation, a whiplash situation. And in less than 24 hours, we went from having the law not being enforced to being enforced for about four to six hours to not being enforced again. Um, so in practicality, it was never enforced. And yes, it essentially, they began with a district court case. And in February, the district court here in Texas, uh, Judge Azra, found that it was unconstitutional and placed an injunction upon it uh, until you know it could run its course. It uh, got to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, and then was immediately appealed again up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically did not rule on the constitutionality. Uh, but said that the state could go ahead with the law, with enforcing the law. That was then the morning. And then by the afternoon, the Fifth Circuit had gotten the case back and said, actually, in a two to one decision, that we are going to keep the pause on SB4. We're going to schedule arguments for yesterday, which they did have. And we're going to keep the pause indefinitely. And at this moment, right now, it's gone back into a pause into it into the injunction and we don't know when it's going to come back uh, uh ostensibly it would be whenever the fifth circuit uh, makes their decision and then of course it will be almost certainly appealed again by whoever loses up to the supreme court and we don't know if it'll go into effect in that interim but as of right now it's with the fifth circuit they've heard the arguments um have not issued a decision but are pausing the law again all right, let's let's try to unpack some of these really thorny problems that this sort of a law introduces. So you we we just mentioned people could have legitimate, potentially legitimate claims to asylum uh, or other uh, immigration statuses. Um, they might you know potentially be eligible. Let's say you have people who could theoretically be eligible for asylum, could be eligible for possibly a T visa, a U visa. I mean, you know, it's the border, and there's a lot of there's a lot of activity that goes on that gives rise to potential claims. So let's so if you have the Texas law enforcement asking people to cross the border and they instead would like to approach a, an immigration officer, CBP officer at one of the border stations and ask for asylum, 
what what theoretically is supposed to happen next? I mean, there are, are there still breaking Texas law, but the federal the the federal officers can can give them a, a credible fear interview or what what what's supposed to happen there? Do you know? Well, first of all, no one really knows. Like I said, that's been the main problem with this law since it was proposed uh, back in the legislature last year. But we're just trying to read between the lines. Essentially, what would happen in your scenario is that the officer and just for a, a note, law enforcement officer under the bill includes 20 di 26 different law enforcement organization groups in Texas, which also happens to include like the uh, Texas Insurance Commission and the State Parks and Wildlife Commission. So literally, this could be anyone, not even state trooper or, or you know, a local police department, which, of course, brings its own issues. But they would ask that person to leave and they could walk right over to a, uh, a CBP officer and, you know, ask for asylum, go through their credible fear interview. Now, under the way the law is written, since this would be now illegal reentry, the felony, um, what would happen if that officer, let's say, decided to camp out outside of that CBP office and wait till that person was, you know, released on their own recognizance, let's say, they would walk out. And even though they may have passed a credible fear interview, that is no bar to being arrested under the illegal reentry. And even more uh, disturbing is the fact that part of SB4 under, again, the illegal reentry is having a status after you have been uh, ordered deported or either by the federal government or the state of Texas, even if you achieve a, a legitimate status, the Texas law states that you can still be arrested and prosecuted under illegal reentry. You know, essentially, that officer could just wait outside that CPB office, arrest this person again, prosecute them under uh, illegal reentry, all while they are going through their asylum process in immigration court. Which, of course, again, is why you have the supremacy clause, so you don't have these contradictions between the federal and the state government. But that's the only way that we can see it work out. And like right off the bat, you see an issue with it. So that's a, a, a huge, a, a gigantic problem right there. First of all, you'd have somebody who had made an asylum application and they're either going to be incarcerated by the state of Texas or else if they're removed by the state of Texas, they're going to be basically abandoning their asylum claim because they'll have Correct. exiting the country without advance parole to get back in. So has the state government, has it really debated the number of people who could the number of additional people who could potentially be incarcerated by the state if this law were really applied, because it seems like there could be an enormous number of people uh, arrested uh, under these and, and without. Uh, in other words, there could be an enormous number of people arrested. So, first of all, has that been has has that been a part of the debate, the number of people that could be incarcerated? It has been, actually. It was brought up not only by, again, immigration advocates and attorneys, but law enforcement officials who came to testify during the, the debates. And essentially, they, would, you know, they wouldn't even come as for or against the law. They'd come as neutral. And their statement was just simply like looking at the amount of, of entries into the United States recently and multiplying that out over years. Uh, you're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And there is no money. In this bill, it is completely unfunded. So their question was, well, if you're going to ask us to do this, our, you know, our, our jails and our prisons are already, you know, at capacity in many situations. How where are we going to put these folks if they are arrested and then eventually convicted, especially of the felony, which literally is years in prison? So there was there what that was brought up, but it was never resolved. So essentially it would just be, well, hey, y'all have to figure it out because we're not giving you any money for it. Um, at this time, that's that's essentially what the sponsors of the bill that was their their company line as far as that particular issue. Okay, now you mentioned twenty eight work uh, law enforcement organizations in the state of Texas who would have the authority to enforce this law, and I can imagine that there would be like the Texas you know Wildlife and Game Commission or correct equivalent. And you can imagine a lot of scenarios where people will encounter law enforcement that might otherwise not be uh, an incident or, an, or, or or law enforcement interaction situation per se, like people go to family court for a child custody hearing or something like that. And there are state law enforcement officers in the courthouse. Now, if they have reason to believe that People coming to attend, let's say, their you know child custody hearing are 
potentially in the country illegally, are they supposed to stop those people uh, while, you know, they're, they've entered the court? Or what was the debate like? I mean, that, that must have come up as to when the police are going to be on the lookout for potential illegals. Yeah. So the essentially the way that it was boiled down in, in the debates, is, and this was, you know, just kind of sussed out between all of the issues that, you know, we've discussed here in the back and forth, is that you have one of two scenarios where you could have the probable cause to arrest someone under this law. One, you have to literally physically see them cross the river around a point of entry. That's the easy probable cause. Most of the time, that's not what cops are doing. They're not sitting at the border, you know, looking for, for folks to cross. That's never been part of their, their deal. But the second part of that is, like you said, probable cause, but how? And the only way that you can get probable cause without that uh, without physically seeing them cross the border is some sort of racial profile. It's just, there's no other way to go about it. You know, do they look like they're undocumented? Do they sound like they're undocumented? I mean, it's, it's not even a slippery slope. It's you're already there with just the first step uh, to identify folks, unless again, you physically see them crossing the border. So yeah, courts are definitely like state courts, family courts are, are have been an issue, not just with this law, but uh, since the previous administration, um, as part of the Know Your Rights presentations we gave, we let folks know, listen, the, the court is not a protected place. Like there were ICE officers many times across the country waiting for folks at courthouses to arrest them and put them in detention and then, you know, into some form of removal. So that is 100 percent a risk that folks have. And again, kind of the what we believe as as advocates and attorneys, part of the reason for the law, if not the main reason for the law, is the intimidation factor to keep folks from participating in the day to day activities that they would, sending their kids to school, going to their court, you know, dates, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, no, that's something that we definitely think would be a a part of it. And the big issue, the big difference, that's even a larger issue, is you don't have you know ICE being alerted through some form or fashion that this individual is going to show up for a court. Uh, hearing that day, you just have to have the local law enforcement, you know, be aware that they're undocumented and they can at least arrest them under the auspices of this law. So it's it is it is a concern for for sure. And while, you know, because the initial uh, arrest is a misdemeanor, the the statute of limitations doesn't go, you know, back in, indefinitely into time. So a lot of folks, you know, may after they are found to be undocumented and even if they did go around the point of entry, if they came here 10 years ago, you know, there's not going to be really any any leg for them to stand on, but it doesn't stop them from being arrested. Um, that, you know, there's enough probable cause for an arrest there. They just won't eventually uh, be prosecuted successfully. So it is a major concern um, with all the kind of interactions uh, that a person has to have with the government or otherwise that they could be racially profiled and possibly removed from the country without, you know, any sort of physical proof that they ever came in uh, undocumented and around a point of entry. How about in the public welfare offices? I mean, people may apply for uh, assistance, you know, food assistance uh, for their children, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they may be undocumented, but their kids might have been born here. Um, you know, if that fact were revealed in requesting any type of state services, let's say for their family members, are any of the public welfare offices authorized, do you know, uh, to in, to make referrals or otherwise enforce this law? That's not, it wasn't specifically included and operating in the, in the nonprofit space, I just, I, get, I have a feeling, and again, this is not confirmed, but with the level of confidentiality that's required for many of these programs, more likely than not, that wouldn't be an issue. But that doesn't mean that a, you know, again, a police officer can't find out like, oh, this person lives at this address and, you know, we have belief that they might be undocumented. We don't have enough to get a warrant to go in their house and arrest them. But, you know, we can follow them to a public place like a public welfare office or a McDonald's and then walk in and arrest them. But there has been no indication that I've seen that there is even there's definitely not a requirement or even an encouragement for, for folks to do that. But they're really also outside of a few enumerated places, which are elementary, middle, and high schools, hospitals, if you're receiving treatment, not if you're like visiting someone getting treatment, and acronym safe places, which are locations where they do like rape kits and things like that. 
unless you were like one of those locations or or a place of worship, uh, then essentially law enforcement is if they are otherwise allowed to detain, interrogate, arrest someone, then they can do it anywhere else in the state of Texas. Let's say uh, someone's undocumented, but they have a child or children who were born in the United States. Let's just return to that scenario for a minute. Sure. What's going to happen if they, if, if somehow they come in contact with Texas law enforcement, uh, and it does become they, they, the police ask for ID, the person doesn't have any ID, or the person speaks very little English or something. Yet they have a child born in the United States. So under Texas's law, the Texas police can take them. But but what do they what would they theoretically do with the children? Because if they're just taking people to the border and asking them to go across, um, that's that's analogous, right? Uh, loosely analogous to an expedited removal. Right? Yes, yeah, I would no, say that's true. Yeah, there's no hearing. There's no judicial hearing there. So and ICE only does expedited removal like that in certain circumscribed situations. But if you're if you have sort of open season to do that across the board, what's going to happen to these uh, U.S. citizen children? They're going to be forced to go to Mexico. They don't have authorization necessarily to be in Mexico. Um, I mean, who they, theoretically, they might have the right to be a Mexican citizen if their parents were from there or something. But let's you know say they don't have proof of that fact. They don't have the right. required documentation of that then you're having a situation where people are being forced into a situation where they can either cross to Mexico, take their children who may or may not have authorization to go across or remain and be charged with a felony. Am I get is that right? No, you're you're absolutely right. I mean the there's several ways I guess it could play out. I mean, technically there is a a judicial proceeding because if someone is arrested then they're taken in front of a judge or a magistrate who offers this, hey, you can be we can go through the whole court case, and you, if you're convicted, you can get up to six months in jail, and then, you know, we would turn you over to ICE is the idea. Or you can take this offer of, if you, you know, haven't committed another crime in accordance with this whole situation, um, this is, you know, you haven't entered previously, then we can just drive you to the border and you can leave and we won't prosecute. Um, so the issue that presents is, of course... If you do have a U.S. citizen child, if you go to this judge or magistrate at whatever time of day and you haven't been able to communicate with your family, you could just end up going to the border and your kids are just left here. And the idea would be, well, then they would end up somehow with other family or in, you know, in the foster care system. But there is no prescribed Proceed solution. Up. Yeah, there's not there's none of that's included. That would just be in the normal course of, of you know, business, essentially. Well. Their parents not here, so they're being neglected. So now they're, you know, wards of the state and they go into the foster care system. Or, well, we've been, uh, I've been doing lots of Know Your Rights presentations around this. And this is just a good idea in general, even without us before ever going into effect, is getting folks to get what's called here in Texas a uh, Chapter 34 guardianship agreement, um, which is a, like a form you can download off of uh, the state's website and fill it out. And it would essentially kick into, kick into uh, place if, and when certain things happen, you can either set it for dates or for if you're removed from this country and then this would terminate if you're ever able to return to this country. And that way folks can place their kids with, it doesn't even have to be a family member, just someone who you need one parent that is willing to sign it out of the two. Then you need the person who would be receiving the child and it needs to be notarized. But if you can get that completed, then you at least that person who you've designated could take over guardianship of your child and they wouldn't go into the foster care system. But again, that that's the besides like the moral quandary of the law in and of itself, the mechanics are complete, as you put it, dumpster fire because there's these thousands of scenarios and none of the solutions to these problems are enumerated. And because the state has never enforced immigration laws, there's no, you know, backup infrastructure that's already in place to deal with these situations. So Basically, law enforcement, like I said, is just as confused as to what they're supposed to do in general as everyone else is. OK, two important questions. First of all, how much of this do you think is is politics in the sense of Texas trying to adopt a, an extreme position to try to force the, the national debate on the border in, in its in the direction that it wishes? I mean, how much do you do you think is and how much do you think? The, that the state is actually really prepared to enforce what it has enacted here. So let's take that one first. 100% politics, 0% ready to enact the law. Uh, oh. It is it is simple 
political posturing. Um, that's been evident from the fact, like I've already mentioned, and we've discussed that the mechanics of the law really don't make any sense if you try to apply it, let alone the constitutional argument, the supremacy clause. And I, I, I even think you're giving uh, our folks here in Texas, uh, our legislatures, a little more credit than I would, that it would be used to drive the conversation, because as we just saw, you know, there was a, a bipartisan agreement on immigration law in the Senate, and it was it was torpedoed before it ever got to the House because, and I even, <laughs> whenever I testified, I can't remember the second or the third time because it came up every special session, one of the times I testified, one of the, the, the legislators asked me, you know, as like Catholic charities, you know, like, and then I was testifying on behalf of the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops, like, well, why don't y'all, you know, advocate for, you know, immigration reform? I'm like, that's all we do. <laughs> I'm like, ever since I came into immigration law 15 years ago, comprehensive immigration reform at that point was, you know, only a day or a month or whatever away. And then it never, never happened. And I, ever since I've been in the nonprofit world, we've been advocating for it, either Catholic Charities or AILA or the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops, both on the state and national level, or the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And what I, I answered, and I think I was unfortunately proven right by the, the Senate bill that got torpedoed, is I honestly don't think that there is a desire to come to a solution, because if you have a solution, then you no longer have a problem. And this is a problem that is very successful for in particular Republicans to campaign on that like, look, it's it's chaos, it's pandemonium. I mean, and the, everyone would even agree on every side of the spectrum. I think that it's a humanitarian crisis. But the problem is, if you solve it, especially with the current president, who is not a Republican in office, then it reflects poorly. And it's just that was my straight answer is I honestly don't think that there is enough momentum on either side of the aisle to get anything done. And then whenever there was actually, you know, I thought, hey, maybe I'm wrong. You know, we got as far as, the, as you know, the Senate and not even out of the Senate completely, uh, and it was already killed. So, no, it's been political posturing from day one. I think that, you know, the folks in, in the legislature, they are very much aware of what the, of the, most of them are attorneys. They're very much aware of what the Constitution entails as far as the United States government negotiating treaties and regulating its own borders and the long history of precedent with the supremacy clause. But now they can go out and say, look, we're getting tough because, you know, and this is the literally their argument that Texas is being invaded. So under the Constitution, a clause is essentially is there for if the federal government couldn't react fast enough in a time before, you know, not even telephone is just, you know, uh, Morse code even that that the state could react to being invaded without having to wait for the federal government to, re to, to tell them it's OK. And so they're essentially using that particular loophole as an argument, well, we're being invaded, and so we don't need the federal government's permission to defend ourselves from this invasion. So it's it's a busted flush argument from, from the jump, and I think everyone's aware of that, and that is why we testified against it, because, again, it's not a solution whatsoever. It's If it's anything, it's more of a burden on Texas, as we've discussed with the law enforcement agencies, the prisons, the jails. But it now is, you know, made national news and it's got, you know, all uh, several other states on board. And now it's a, uh, you know, a talking point for an election year. So I, I think it's 100 percent political posturing, zero percent actually trying to solve the problem. I didn't have doubts that much that the border states, Texas and other border states really wanted to to solve the problem. I thought that in good that they did in good faith want to solve the problem. But after that compromise failed, it, it did seem to give credence to the uh, voices that were saying, hey, this is really a grievance machine that they that the the far right doesn't want to give up on. Um, this is a a cash generating, you know, like a fundraising tool uh, by a bad part of the politics of grievance. Um, so, you know, uh, you they don't want to solve this problem, at least if they don't want to solve it, they don't want to solve it under uh, by the Biden administration. So just let's hold this problem unsolved, despite what we say in public, we're going to hold this problem unsolved until, you know, after the election and then maybe, then maybe we'll solve it after we've milked it. Um, so, I mean, that, you know, that seems like that lends credence to people who, who are saying that just having it on the books is such a, a tool of fear 
what do you think about that? That having a having a law like this on the books, um, just like if you have, uh, let's say, in the reproductive rights, if you have very very stringent, you know, laws uh, on reproductive uh, freedom and uh, etc., it has a chilling effect or it has a fear inducing effect on the community at large. Um, you know how much of how much of that do you think is at play? It's like we have this, you know, club that we can hit you with, even if we don't hundred percent intend you to hit hit you with it. Now, you you should know that we have it, uh, and that fear is also you know part of the uh, political climate. That's another question I have. And then thirdly, how does ICE feel about you know having the state as a partner in its in its mission? as a general proposition i mean have they have they made any any statements uh, uh obviously they must have but what has ice been saying as far as you know sure so as far as i know ice has remained somewhat neutral on it kind of the the statements of you know we're always happy to accept any assistance as long as it's coordinated effectively with you know federal authorities but you know that leaves it open to we don't we're not saying that you're coordinating this effectively, but we're also not saying that we wouldn't take any help if you were willing to provide it. But I mean, there have been interactions on the border, particularly between uh, DPS, Department of Public Safety and Customs and Border Protection, like over the razor wire and things. But ICE has kind of tried to play both sides of it so far because, again, they haven't been forced to do anything as of yet because the law hasn't gone into effect. Um and then, I mean, as far as, like, a chilling effect, it absolutely is. Um, the issue we saw, I, what I've been comparing this to over the last decade, was the uh, changes to the public charge rule, or the proposed changes to the public charge rule under the previous administration, where folks were literally pulling their kids out of, their U.S. citizen kids, out of public school, taking them off of, of food stamps or other uh, public welfare systems that their children were entitled to as U.S. citizens because even though there was no way that they could even obtain these because they were documented, the, these benefits, it was you know not laid out clearly that their children receiving them wouldn't affect them. We as, you know, attorneys and again, advocates pouring over the law and making sure, you know, that we understood that they couldn't be prosecuted for that. It didn't matter. And especially, and this is another issue we run into anytime there is a law that does have a chilling effect or a change in policy that does have a chilling effect, it turns into a, a, a multiplied, exponentially multiplied game of telephone through social media. And every, that's where everyone, I feel, gets their news these days, or if it's not everyone, a large portion of folks. And so they'll hear something that, you know, someone drops on Facebook or Instagram or even TikTok and, and faster, you know, the I forget the exact phrase, but, you know, the a lie can circumvent the world before like the, the truth even gets out the door. And that's what will happen. It's not even a lie, just misinformation can get out the door. And that just increases the chilling effect within the community itself because they are rightly terrified based on the fact of, you know, what they hear. And it's not just what's in the law, it's the rhetoric that goes with it. And I think that's what really contributes to that chilling effect is even though folks, you know, might not who have been here for 5, 10, 20 years undocumented, you know, that the law, again, ostensibly would not apply to them, the illegal entry law. Um, they think, you know, well, because they're passing passing this law, I could be racially profiled and you know, arrested and and they don't understand those little nuances. So what they do is they, you know, completely shut down, take their kids out of school, try to move, you know, across the, the country without, you know, having the means to do so. And so putting themselves in a, and their families in a worse financial situation than they were already in. So yeah, it definitely has a chilling effect. And we've seen that happen before. And I've seen it happening already without this law even going into effect as of yet. Right. It's a it, 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 it you were referring to the the telephone effect where each person hears a piece of news and they put their own spin on it. And Correct. It gradually gets the information gets warped and uh, distorted as time, but more and more distorted as time goes by. And absolutely that has, tends to ha happen in society. It happens a lot among immigrants that are. Um, so um, but yes, uh, it's a tool for further marginalizing an already marginalized community. And uh you're generating a climate of fear, which has the effect of causing people to shrink from contact with anyone associated with the government, with the state government. 
So like you said, take their kids out of school or not apply for benefits, let's say that their children might be entitled that they might actually need because they're afraid of coming in contact with anyone associated with the government. I mean, all these fears can cause people to change their behavior, whether or not their fear has a, a, a whether or not there's really a reason for them to be afraid realistically or not. Um, how about the relationship between the community and local law enforcement? That, I guess, is just burned down when you're talking about, I mean, if you take an area and I've spent my share of time in South Texas and take an area like Arlington, yeah. Texas or Brownsville or something where, you know, the majority of the people in those areas uh, have uh, Mexican or Central American ancestry. I mean, you know, local law enforcement to investigate crimes in general, uh, you know, relies on interacting with the public to gather information. What does a law like this do to the community's trust in police? I mean, it, it devastates it. It's it's already, you know, it's a ten, uh, historically, there's already a tenuous relationship between immigrant communities and police officers. And that's even immigrants that are here lawfully because many of them come from countries where the police forces are incredibly corrupt and, you know, might be in the pocket of of different, you know, terrorist groups or or criminal gangs or whatever the case may be. And it's, you know, you'll be, you're aware of this, but I mean, the, the reason the U visa was created wasn't at the behest of, you know, primarily anyone but law enforcement agencies because they were having so much difficulty trying to get information from these immigrant communities that they thought, hey, and, you know, let's offer a carrot if you will, are willing to help us by reporting these crimes and being whatever we classify as, you know, helpful in assisting and arresting and or prosecuting them, you know, we can, we can perhaps provide you a pathway to permanent residency and, and citizenship. So it's very counterproductive. And like I said, you know, that's that was created for a reason. And this is just enhancing it further, the the alienation between law enforcement and the immigrant communities. And again, even the the leak the 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 immigrant communities where folks might be here lawfully or might have mixed status families, you know, that this US citizen children might not want to report that, you know, they're a uh, parent is being attacked by someone because their parents undocumented and this is what they've heard on the news. So yeah, it's a it's a major concern and like I said, it's very strange how things have changed in the 20 some odd years since U visas have existed that you know originally law enforcement agencies were looking for ways to break into those insular communities and try to try to prosecute criminals where now they're just enacting legislation that's going to push those folks deeper into the shadows. Now, has the state thought about now? There is a section of the federal law which authorizes. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it might be Section 287, which authorizes the federal government to essentially deputize state law enforcement to assist with certain immigration functions. Has I mean, has that been explored as an alternative to you know the state trying to bring people to the border on its own? Why not have if Texas wants to utilize its state law enforcement to help immigration enforcement, why not cooperate and allow ICE to be in the driver's seat, you know, rather than trying to do it yourself when you're not trained for it? For sure. And there have been several municipalities that have signed those MOUs with the federal government uh, since that that partnership was, you know, made available. That's it's been controversial in many communities here in Texas, but that has been going on. The problem is, is that as you said, ICE is in the driver's seat. That means in in the eyes of the Texas legislature, at least is how they're portraying it to their constituents, that's putting the federal government, not, not a particular ICE officer or ICE, the organization, but the federal government in the driver's seat. And the whole point of this is that the federal government has failed us. And if we let them steer the, the boat, then they're going to drive us onto the rocks just like they have you know, for the last however many decades that we've needed comprehensive immigration reform. So while that has been explored in the past, now that there is a an administration that is at least open to exploring certain comprehensive immigration reform, like more uh, immigration judges at the border, like uh, work authorization uh, much sooner for folks who are going through asylum processes and willing to give some enforcement, you know, uh, concessions that not necessarily everyone in their convention or of their constituency that would be 100% supported of, it doesn't matter because it's the federal government. And that is that is the boogeyman in the room. Okay. 
Um, what's, where has the Mexican government come out on SB4? What have its statements been? And, um, you know, has it made any statements about what actions Mexico might take were this law actually to go into? Oh, yeah. No, they've been they've been vocal. Um, we partner with the Mexican government through their local consulate. And, uh, you know, we've had discussions with them about this law when it was being proposed and once it passed and as things have developed. And the Mexican government uh, in general has made statements that if this was to go into effect, they have no intention of just allowing anyone who we want to send over, as you said, outside from maybe uh, Mexican nationals. Um, and again, only through a process to where they can make sure that this person, you know, doesn't have outstanding warrants in Mexico or whatever the case may be. Uh, but they've made it very clear that they have no intention of honoring this law as far as accepting people coming across the border. Uh, so, again, th that's just one out of a thousand mechanics of this law that doesn't where, you know, it's it's got a thousand points of failure and you only need one point for the whole thing to fall apart. And that's another huge one. It's like we're going to try to send someone over and then the country we're trying to send them to is going to tell us no. And now you've got literally law enforcement standing off against law enforcement across an international border. And it's not even the federal government on our side that's engaged in the standoff, which again, brings up a whole uh, hornet's nest of, of issues with diplomacy and international treaties and things of that nature. So Justin, as best you can tell, where do you think the Fifth Circuit is going to come out on this issue uh, based on the arguments? I think that they will most likely decide probably two to one that the uh, law is unconstitutional, just again, because the the argument that that the that an invasion justifies these laws being enacted, that that's the loophole they're trying to to fit this through. But I don't know if that's wishful thinking, to be honest, because the reason it got appealed up to the Supreme Court was because the uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, you know, basically said that we're not going to declare the law unconstitutional. So. I think the Fifth Circuit most likely will probably declare the law as unconstitutional after the full arguments. And I, my hope is that the Supreme Court would, but I don't have a lot of confidence that they will, given how they reacted the first time that it made it up to the Supreme Court, uh, that they would let the law continue as is until you know the full court case made its way uh, through the Fifth Circuit and then back up to the Supreme Court. It's just, it's... I, I find it mind boggling because I have spoken to attorneys, criminal attorneys across the political spectrum, and basically everyone looks at it and says, on this face, this looks like it violates the supremacy clause fairly clearly. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I've been surprised by, you know, uh, Supreme Court decisions over the last few years, or maybe not surprised, but kind of. I've seen them coming and been surprised that we got to this point, but given how the Supreme Court's made up, at this point, I don't think you can guarantee that it would be found unconstitutional, even though it seems to me every criminal attorney I speak with, you know, even looking at it and outside an immigration context, like someone who has expertise in the criminal area, that this does not in any way comport with the Constitution and having the separation of powers or something that is very clearly stated to be a purview of the federal government. So district court said it was unconstitutional. I think it's probably a 50-50 shot that the Court of Appeals will, will declare it unconstitutional. But given how the Supreme Court reacted, my opinion, I think has shifted on that, that I think there is a, you know, 51% chance that they will declare this this as a constitutional law. Whereas uh, you could ask me that like three or six months ago, and I would have said no, almost certainly. Like, you know, there's a chance that the Supreme Court will declare it unconstitu or, uh, declare constitutional, but... Now I'd say that that's closer to a 50-50 shot. Let's assume the worst case scenario. Let's let's say the law were to go into effect. Um, you know, what what's the on the ground response been like so far as far as, uh, let's say, Catholic charities, other advocacy organizations, civil rights groups? I mean, what what are they planning as far as mobilization or efforts to, uh, you know, uh, let's say, curtail some of the possible very negative effects? Sure. So, I mean, from the start, like I mentioned, we've been testifying at the legislature since this law was proposed, and uh, that includes Catholic Charities of Central Texas, uh, American Gateways. It's one of the uh, the parties in the lawsuit, a local uh, 
immigrant legal services and advocacy group, uh, as well as uh, several other immigrant advocacy groups across the state. So it began right when, when we saw, you know, on the horizon, this being an issue. And then as far as practical things we've done on the ground, many of us have gotten together and pulled resources and essentially come up with add-ons for Know Your Rights presentations to educate the public and also service providers, whether it's public schools or uh, nonprofits or even local churches. Um, I've given presentations to essentially laying out, this is what SB4 is, this is what it is not, this is, you know, what someone should do to prepare for the worst case, you know, getting their emergency plan together. These are the requirements under the law in Texas and going over Know Your Rights that you know, if you are, you don't have to show your ID in Texas. Um, if a law enforcement officer just asks for it, if you're arrested, you do have to identify yourself, but you do not have to, again, have to provide paperwork. You just have to provide your name, your date of birth, and your address, and that way you can't also be charged with a failure to identify. And just really stressing that to folks and then trying to encourage them to not take their kids out of school and not stop living their lives, um, especially given the fact that SB4 hasn't gone into effect yet and really encouraging them to avail themselves of resources like the Chapter 34 Guardianship Agreement to try to prepare for the worst case scenario while advocating, you know, whether it was at the, at the state legislator or legislature or now, you know, through either filing uh, one of the lawsuits or uh, supporting them in the community, um, trying to inform the public, both, again, the, the the community that could be affected as well as the folks they interact with, whether it's their teachers or or the nonprofits they work with, and uh, just trying to stay up on it. Because as we saw this week, um, literally you can have uh, uh, go there and back again in less than, you know, 14 hours. So that's what we're trying to do is keep everyone informed and make sure they have the best information to protect themselves uh, should the law go into effect. But in to, to, to be honest, protect themselves regardless if SB4 ever goes into effect, just to make sure they know what their rights are. Yeah, we could, I mean, it's we're, it's it's very turbulent. It's it's really a very, very volatile situation legally, constitutionally, and obviously practically on the grounds in terms of its humanitarian dimensions. Certainly going to be a bit of a roller coaster ride until we get, you know, a final decision from eventually the Supreme Court on this issue. And we'll see, we'll see, you know, what what is the current Supreme Court's uh, idea about the supremacy clause. I mean, could we be in for a rethink on on the parameters of the supremacy clause, kind of the, the way we're in for a rethink on Chevron deference, which was a, a doctrine that, you know, was around for quite a long time. Um, deference of courts to agency, federal agency decisions. And then that that is now being, you know, scaled back uh, significantly. Um, so we we will see. Um, but, Justin, we we do very much appreciate you engaging in this really thought provoking and, and informative discussion about Texas law SB4, uh, a, an, a, a, an immigrant a state law that would affect the rights of immigrants and would affect really uh, the rights of all Texas residents. Um, before we leave, let us just um, give, give a shout out to Catholic Charities of Central Texas, who are the senior director of immigration at services and refugee resettlement. Um, just tell us real quick, uh, tell us a little bit about the services provided by your organization. Sure. So uh, my two programs, as you mentioned, Immigration Legal Services and, and Refugee Support Services, we both provide representation for folks going through just about any type of immigration process, whether that's uh, an immigration court or affirmative, applying for naturalization, DACA renewals, family-based immigration, uh, where we can, for example, for, with the refugee grant, we provide our services uh, free of charge. Um, otherwise, we uh, make sure that we have enough funding to where we can charge a low cost fee to our clients. Typically, it's about uh, 20 to 30 percent of what a for-profit private attorney would charge uh, for a similar service in the central Texas area. And we walk them through the entire process from beginning to end. We don't just help them fill out the applications. Uh, we make sure that you know, whatever the outcome of their particular case may be, that we're going to be there uh, from start to finish. And then as far as our refugee support services, uh, we opened that um, officially a year ago this month. Um, and those services include everything for uh, from refugee cash and medical assistance for the first year that someone's in the country or the first year of their uh, particular status, like asylee status, 
the medical being uh, a form of Medicaid, social adjustment services, which are just generally helping folks integrate into the American community, the local community, employment services, helping those uh, with work authorization either get employed or get uh, more gainful employment, um, you know, that actually has benefits and other parts of our employment uh, system that we enjoy, uh, as well as uh, Refugee School Impact, which is a uh, particular program helping families, uh, refugee families uh, with school age children, um, with uh, homework assistance, um, school orientation, uh, educating the educators essentially on different issues that these folks run into either, you know, with their uh, legal proceedings in immigration law or just generally they run into uh, being in a new country. So uh, those are the services we provide under my programs. And then we also have other programs such as uh, financial assistance, uh, mental health counseling, uh, as well as uh, re uh, veteran services. Um, so we you know, can refer folks uh, that are in our program to their programs, and we receive referrals uh, from those other programs as well. But our idea is to, essentially our mission statement is to assist those that are typically underserved or marginalized to provide them the dignity that they deserve. And hopefully that whenever they leave our organization, however many programs they take advantage of, uh, that they'll not only be better off than when they came in, but that hopefully they won't need our services anymore and can go out and stand on their own two feet and be able to you know, be a productive member of society and have worked through all of their issues. Okay. Well, that, thank you very much for that wonderful summary about Catholic Charities of Central Texas. Thank you, Justin. And um, that's all we have for today. Please join us next time on the Immigration Uncovered podcast. And thank you. Thanks for having me.